do the the first the first killing that's attributed to uh, the group known as the Glennon Gang um, was in was in seventy two, I believe. And for for anyone who doesn't know, can, can you fill us in a bit on who the Glennons yes. were, their formation, kind of yes. what they did, their members? Yeah. Well, first of all, it's a misnomer. <laughs> it, it, the way that you, you think of a name for something or someone and it sticks, or even though it's not particularly accurate. And the Glenan gang gets its name from a little village in South Armagh called Glenan, where some of the gang members were, were based. Um, but it is a misnomer because other members of the gang came from counties Tyrone uh, and, and down. Uh, it's not, and, and, and their operations uh, went as far south as Dublin and as far north as Pomeroy in County Tyrone. So first of all, it's a useful shorthand to call them the Glenan gang. But first of all, the Glenan bit isn't uh, very really accurate, although it was one area of their of their activities. And secondly, the word gang isn't really uh, accurate either, because because um, they were not so much a gang uh, of a consolidated gang of a limited number of people all working together. That was more disparate than that. It was permutations of the same people. There were links between all of all of the people, but they were they didn't operate as a cohesive gang. They were they shared weapons, they shared intelligence, they they shared direction, uh, but they weren't. It would be wrong to think of them as a gang in the in the way of a street gang in New York, for example. Um, they they all they wouldn't necessarily even have known each other. They may have known of each other, but they operated in various spheres of influence as north as, as Tyrone and as far south as South Armagh. North Armagh, the, the Porter Down area, was another uh, particular area of influence and also a, a part of Dungannon called Moy Gashel was another area they were very active in. But uh, for, for shorthand, yes, we call them the Glenan Gang. And they were, there was a group of people, a disparate group of people who operated in the Mid Ulster area, as far north as Pomeroy, as far south as Dublin, um, and um, they uh, they shared weapons and intelligence, and they were op they operated between 1972 and about and the and 1976 around then when when I think at that stage the British themselves realised that they were in very dangerous territory, and um, the gang was split up. But but the collusion continued. Collusion continued right the way through the conflict right up until the very end. It changed its nature. The nature of the Glenan gang was one of the things that we found particularly interesting is that the Glenan gang chose as their targets ordinary people. They didn't target Republicans. They didn't target IRA men or Sinn Féin uh, members or workers. They targeted ordinary people. Um, one of the things we did when we were researching the book was we took the names of all of the people killed by the Glenan gang. And we listed on one side of a piece of paper, those who were very, just very unlucky that they were killed at random. And on the other side of the piece of paper, we listed those who were targeted, who were killed precisely for who or what they were. And of all of those who were targeted, who were, who were singled out for death, uh, only one had Republican links. Every single one of the uh, all the others were ordinary people. They were businessmen. But there was some. There was something particular about them. They were all doing well. They either had businesses of their own, or they were they bought a bit of land, maybe, or they were building a house somewhere. They were people who were upwardly mobile. You know, who'd gone um, to secondary school, who had perhaps had gone to university, or who were just very enterprising and hardworking, and who had built up businesses. So these were the sort of people that the Glenan gang targeted. It was particularly pernicious because the we believe that the intention was to terrorize an entire community, um, all those people in the nationalist Catholic community who were demanding uh, equality, demanding civil rights, demanding their national rights, indeed, and, and um, demanding their economic rights as well, and who were doing well and who were upwardly mobile and had their own businesses were building their own houses, maybe. Those were the people that the Glenan gang targeted in order to terrorize everyone else who fell into that category in the community. And it, it kind of fits in with, uh, um, there's a strategist that mo most, if not all of your 
listeners may not be aware of, called Sir Frank Kitson, who was um, a military strategist, a counterinsurgency strategist, who's written a series of books. And he had many theories, one of them being that the law should be used in the counterterrorism context as just another way of disposing of unwanted members of the public. And that's a direct quote from his book. But he also believed that if you couldn't, he was uh, on behalf of the British, he was saying, if you can't catch the fish that you want to catch by rod or net, then another way of doing it is to pollute the water, to poison the water. And we think that his counterinsurgency strategy was, was that, and he's written about it, that if you can't catch the people you want to catch by rod or net, then you poison the water. And that is the context that we see the Glenan gangs targeting of victims being, that they, they, he, that they were poisoning the water, they were terrorizing an entire community into, with, into reducing their demands for national rights and civil rights, for economic rights, by terrorizing them, if you if you lift your head too high over the parapet, you are going. We are going to get you. It was as brutal as that. Um, th there were th there were a few kind of more more well known members of the gang, but but one um, who was actually an RUC officer and who ended up um, who ended up providing a lot of a lot of the evidence that that kind of broke broke the case. I think was a man named John Weir. Um, can, can you tell us yes. about John, John Weir? John Weir was um, was a Protestant from south of the border who joined the RUC and became a member of its special patrol group, which was an elite outfit within the RUC. He was involved in at least two murders that we that we know of. He one one of which he was convicted for, um, but. I think when, when he went to jail, I think he began to feel that he was a scapegoat for, uh, he was being used as a scapegoat for um, others within the same force as he was. And he began to talk and he gave interviews to people and he made claims and he wrote an affidavit in 1999, uh, which he stands by. And he's he's currently he was one of the sources for the book and the film of the book, which was called Unquiet Graves, which can still be watched online uh, via Journeyman Pictures if anyone's interested. And he's still alive and he's living in South Africa. Um, and he was he was a member he was a member of the Glen Ann Gang and has spoken openly about it. And he says that collusion is much more wide widespread than as than hitherto forethought. Um, and uh, there was also um, another person of, of interest in this field was a former UDR man called um, Robin Jackson, who was also an RUC, a paid agent by the RUC, and also a prolific killer, the Jackal, known as the Jackal, yes. He's he's now passed his reward. Um, I'll leave you to, to imagine what reward that might be in the next life. But he was a particularly prolific killer, and he was he was in, he was being paid by the RUC, and he was uh, singling out people to murder for years and years and years, and lived what we call over here a charmed life. You know that he was involved in many things, but somehow seemed to evade detection for much of his career as a paramilitary. Uh, and there, and uh, most people over here have never even heard the name Robin Jackson. Um, and most people probably over there in America haven't either, but he was he's dead now, but he was he was a prolific killer and he was being paid by the police. We're pretty we're, we're, I'm 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 pretty sure he was being paid by the IUC. It's very hard to look at the evidence and not come to that conclusion. Um, but that would still be disputed by many people. But as far as we're concerned, having seen the evidence and read the evidence in heart, in black and white, um and the reason that we have the evidence, I should say, because collusion is unique in, cr in crime because there's no such crime as collusion on, on the statute book. Um, it's very hard to prove collusion because of its essence, it's hidden, it's covered. It's something that, uh, isn't, that, is, that isn't written down. You, you, know, you don't write down that you're going to 
you know, no loyalist or policeman would write down on a piece of paper 